गुड मॉर्निंग समीर सर गुड मॉर्निंग डॉक्टर मलिक और यू सर वेरी गुड आई जस्ट फिनिश यू नो कंक्लूडेड वन मीटिंग सो आई जस्ट गॉट अ बिट डिलेड जॉइनिंग यू गाइस हेलो हेलो या हां नमस्कार सर नमस्कार नमस्कार डॉक्टर मलिक so let the candidate join then uh, we can start with one or two minute in the meantime if you want you can upload your uh, ppt ah uh, yeah sure i can share my screen with you it's visible yes sir. yes sir it is visible can you move sir to next slide so that i can see it is working or not <clears throat> now it's full screen i hope ah uh, yes sir it's full in full mode ah uh, yes sir it is moving it is moving right sir right sir right sir. so yeah i think you know whenever i can start Actually, sir, uh, this program uh, we thought basically that uh, lot of persons are working in materials as well as so uh, we thought that there should be a group type of activity like uh, different departments can join together and explore the things like how the materials can be used for the devices applications. Right. So, so that's why the kind of the joint activity with the electronic mm-hmm. department as well as the mathematics department. So that's why we have tried to uh, plan some uh, lectures. Uh, from the basic as well as some the devices application. Okay, and yeah, that'll be nice. So I can get uh, feedback from a lot of different viewpoints. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So have you visited sometimes, sir, in Jalandhar or Punjab? Uh, no, Jalandhar I have never been to. Punjab, of course. Okay, okay, okay. So next time, because it's a online board, next time we will try to invite you in a oh, physical board. <laughs> great to great to visit you, people. So can we start, sir? Any time, any time. Okay, okay, okay. Shall I start now? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can start now. So let me introduce first. Yes. So uh, very good morning to all the participants, and let us welcome Professor Samir Kumar Sapraji, and uh, personally, sir, and on behalf of other department. we are greatly thankful to you so giving this opportunity to twilight as lander to listen to you and uh, i am sure that uh, not only the physics department but uh, all the participants who are online or uh, will see at the youtube channel will highly beneficial to listen to you so once again uh, i welcome you sir so dr samir sapra is interested in the development of the materials for the energy conversation photovoltaics and photocatalytics being the main he obtained his doctorate in chemistry from the indian institute of science bangalore working with professor dd sharma on the electronic and optical properties of semiconductor nano crystals in the year 2004 after completing his phd he was awarded the alexander von humboldt fellowship to carry out research on the luminance properties of the quantum dots at the ludwig maximilian university of munich from there he moved to the group of the professor dr alexander in the rest after researching for 3 years on the luminance properties of quantum dot samir moved back to india and joined the indian institute of technology delhi where he currently works on various aspect of nanomaterials his interest ranging from basic size and shape dependent study synthesis of new materials such as those based on transition metal dazerknites and proskites light emitting materials photovoltaic devices and photocatalytic applications including hydrogen and oxygen evolution reactions he has published around 100 research papers in highly indexed journal which and has h index of more than 39 along with research he teaches various courses in physical chemistry and material chemistry and mentor a large number of the postdoctorate fellow phd masters as well as bachelor students so once again uh, welcome you sir 
at this STC course and uh, Dr. Samir Safra will mm -hmm. talk on the topic nano hair mm -hmm. structure based on 2D transition metal, dichalconides, MOIC2 for optoelectronics and catalytic applications. Over to Professor Samir Safra ji. Yes. Sir. Thank you so much uh, Dr. Malik for the very kind introduction that you have given me and thank you so much for inviting me uh, to the conference STC at Jalandhar. So, I'll be um, talking about some of the most recent activities that are going on in our group. And <clears throat> we started working on these materials roughly about four years back. That's when we started with the 2D transition metal dichalcogenite. Sorry for the spelling mistake. Dichalcogenite. Um, I'm going to tell you mostly about molybdenum selenide, diselenide. Uh, and we'll take a look at some of the nano heterostructures and uh, the optoelectronic and electrocatalytic applications that arise out of these heterostructures. And I'm working at the Department of Chemistry at IIT Delhi. So, anytime you visit Delhi, come across, you can always come and say hello to me or take a look at my website or send emails to me over here. Well, most of the work or rather all of the work that I'm going to tell you about today has been carried out by some of these bright students over here, in particular Shamim. Uh, most of the work is part of his PhD thesis, followed by Ajit, who's carrying on this work and Sahil and Varsha, who have also joined in the efforts on 2D materials in the group. And I also must thank my collaborators, Praveen Ingole, who does a lot of electrochemistry for us. Uh, Ritu Srivastava from NPL, with whom we started all the <clears throat> 2D work and the photovoltaic work. Uh, Shashwata Bhattacharya is from the physics department at IIT Delhi, uh, who does a lot of DFT calculations for us and Samit from uh, IIT Kharagpur and Bose Institute, he was the director at that time, um, with whom we made a lot of photoconductive devices. And the funding agencies, of course, DST, DRDO, SCRB, and IIT Delhi itself for generous funding to support our research activities. All right. So, more often than not, if you look at a materials chemists or scientists in general, condensed matter physicists these days, uh, the prime energy, the, the prime concern is energy. Okay. Whether they are involved in converting energy using solar cells, hydrogen generation, fuel cells, um, you know, even piezoelectric materials, thermoelectrics, or to store energy in batteries or supercapacitors or pseudocapacitors or some sort of fuels. Yeah. Everybody is looking for these cleaner means or to utilize the energy smartly. So getting on to light emitting devices, smarter grids. And finally, to get rid of all the dirt that is over there. So regeneration, photocatalytic degradation, conversion, carbon dioxide reduction, right? Uh, so these are some of the key issues that concern us. And the things that are highlighted in green are the ones that we've been working on in our laboratory. And uh, shortly we are starting some work. We started some work on carbon dioxide reduction as well. So um, what essentially started uh, way back with my PhD and then carried over to the present day are these nanomaterials. And the photo that I'm showing you is that of cadmium selenide nanomaterials or quantum dots. And uh, these are the red ones which are about six and a half nanometer in diameter and the blue ones are two and a half nanometers in diameters, everything ranging in between these two sizes. 
Um, and just by changing the size of cadmium selenide, one could very easily tune <coughs> the optical and electronic properties of these nanomaterials. And this was way back in the late 90s, early 2000s, when we worked on these kind of materials during my PhD. And to date, uh, I sometimes continue to use these materials for various applications or you know, put them along with some other new materials that we are working on. I'll show you some of these examples in the talk. So, and this is just a quantum size effect, you know, simple uh, particle in a box model from our basic quantum mechanics that essentially tells you, um, well, the formula n square h square by 8 m l square where you increase the length of the box and the energy level spacing keeps on decreasing. Okay, so you increase the particle size, the energy level spacing keeps on decreasing and these are fluorescence colors by the way. And so which is uh, essentially band edge emission. So the band gap of the material keeps on decreasing as you increase the size. So based on a lot of, so this is one particular nanomaterial that I like to show but we work on a lot of nanomaterials and based on all these nanomaterials, we try and explore various things. For example, uh, nanomaterials have a large chunk of atoms on the surface. So there's a lot of surface property relationship that we study. Okay, I've mentioned about quantum size effects, uh, crystal structures. That's another very interesting thing. When you have such small sizes, um, then the crystal structures are not well defined. For example, you can take uh, woodsite and zinc blend, they are interconvertible and for very small size, like less than two, three nanometer particles, it's very difficult to tell apart the two crystal structures. We focus on synthesis methods, new synthesis methods for new materials, of course. And we do a lot of studies both on uh, ensembles and on single particles and that tells us a lot about uh, the properties of these materials. Other than that, we've ventured into photovoltaics and photocatalysis. Uh, for example, we make disensitized quantum dot sensitized solar cells and we're trying out the perovskite solar cells in our lab. We've been working a lot on water splitting. I'll give some examples of that. Hydrogen evolution and oxygen evolution reactions using a number of the materials that we synthesize in the laboratories. Uh, perovskites, as I just mentioned, perovskite solar cells are a very interesting class of materials. For the last uh, 12 years or so, People have been working on these perovskites, very promising for the solar cell applications. Of course, we are developing new materials because, you know, the perovskites that are there, they have a lot of lead in them and there's issue of stability. Although we've achieved 25% uh, solar cell efficiencies, but still lead and stability are the key issues that need to be addressed. So we work on layered materials, double perovskites, where we can get rid of lead so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> in the past, we've worked a lot on light emitting devices with a focus towards white light emitting devices. And off and on, even now, we, we do get a lot of emission and we see white light emission from various materials. Okay. Uh, we've also worked on sensors. There have been biosensors, for example, the the schematic shown over here is based on DNA base pairing and uh, makes use of nanomaterial surfaces over here so that you have many, many more DNA molecules attached and uh, the signals are enhanced to a large extent. Uh, this particular one is from a paper that addresses chronic myelogenous leukemia, so a cancer and early detection of this cancer ethanol sensors, a lot of transistors for various ions. So we've, we've done a lot of these sensor activities. And also, uh, 
the materials have found their way into these poor mice where you can actually um, you know make these vesicles over here liposomes is what the biologists love to call them and put in a lot of materials including your quantum dots including na magnetic nanoparticles including drugs so there's something called theranostics that goes on so you can localize these um, liposomes near your cancer cells and release the drugs near the cancer cells so you don't have to kill the healthy cells uh, but all these activities that are highlighted in yellow these are with very strong collaborative efforts right we don't make the sensors ourselves we don't do the bile applications we sometimes do make leds but uh, for making more professional stuff we definitely need a lot of support okay for the materials yes <laughs> we do and today i'm going to talk of uh, these 2d transition metal dichalcogenides we've been working on molybdenum sulfide molybdenum selenide niobium sulfide tungsten selenide niobium selenide tin sulfide which is not a transition metal dichalcogenide by the way but still it's a 2d material um, and we make a lot of heterostructures of these materials okay so i'll be discussing mostly these results today and let's see what we have so uh, introduction i'll be giving you a slightly longer introduction you can tell me to stop if there are not many students over there i presume that there are some students who would love to listen to uh, some of these aspects and then i'll go on and tell you about some of the applications of these transition metal dichalcogenides and their heterostructures so the, the most common one is molybdenum sulfide which has been studied by far um, and it's naturally at an abundant 2h polytype i'll tell you about what this 2h means and it has been used for a very very long time if you see it has been used for dry lubricants in fact in our chemistry labs uh, people used molybdenum sulfide just to fill up the readings of burettes okay and uh, for catalytic activities for cathode materials so you see this curve shows you the number of papers of molybdenum sulfide which was kind of flattish compared with the last decade and that is after the discovery of graphene uh, which should be somewhere over here okay right roughly around isolation of 2d atomic layers and that's when the interest in single layer molybdenum sulfide starts to show it, its effects and now a lot more researchers um, make two-dimensional materials and study them uh, the direct band gap of molybdenum sulfide is 1.9 ev but it's only from a single layer when you have multi layers it's not a direct band gap because the interlayer interactions um, form the top of the the bottom of the conduction band and they are at a different point other than the k point where you have a direct band gap uh, 2d materials you have conductors graphene you had insulators hexagonal boron nitride and then once single layer molybdenum sulfide was discovered then you also had semiconductors so the complete this is complete right you have conductors insulators semiconductors and therefore a lot more could be done with 2d materials the good thing is they are flexible and because you know it's just one monolayer they're transparent and you're looking for very low power devices in electronics and we've been working on some of these aspects 
hydrogen evolution and chemical sensing. Um, I'll not talk about chemical sensing today, but there are some of our publications which I urge you to see. Um, so coming back to the 2H thing that I was mentioning, the structure is uh, somewhat very easy to understand. Okay, if you look at the top view, uh, then you have this 2H phase, which is the most common. 2 is two monolayers and H is hexagonal. And that is what is required to make one unit cell. Okay. On the other hand, the <coughs> tetragonal phase requires only one monolayer for the unit cell. It's an ABC packing. Um, the close pack structure, these are hexagonal, right? Um, ABC type of packing and that's one monolayer is enough. And the 3R structure reads the rhombohedral three monolayers for defining a complete unit cell. Okay. Uh, you could also think of uh, the bonding like this. Uh, when you look at the molybdenum atoms, okay, they are in the center over here. And these are your sulfur atoms or whatever other chalcogen. This is uh, an octahedral coordination. Okay. And that is what is there in the 1T polytype. But if you look at molybdenum electron count, then molybdenum 4 plus has only 2D electrons. Okay. And if you have only 2D electrons, then these uh, T2G, EG, which is there in octahedral, is not so favorable. But you could distort this and come over to the trigonal prismatic and then the dz square would have both these electrons and that's the most stable configuration so that's why you find a trigonal prismatic as opposed to an octahedral so uh, these two triangles are in the eclipsed configuration rather than the staggered configuration if you want to think of it that way you know it's just the rotation of the octahedral uh, but people do find the 1t polytype when they try to put some lithium to exfoliate the molybdenum sulfide sheets. So, you know, these are stacked layers and then you want to exfoliate, you put some lithium. What lithium does is to dope one electron and goes in as lithium plus. Once this electron comes here, then you have the three filled levels T2G and that makes the octahedral more stable than the trigonal prismatic. And therefore, you get the 1T polytype. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is exactly what I was discussing. Uh, but with some more numbers over here. Okay. So, you have... What you have is between the layers, there's Van der Waals interaction, which is, of course, weaker than the intralayer covalent bonding. And that's why you can exfoliate all these structures. Yeah. All right, uh, we'll come to Raman later. I can tell you something. Mm. Typically, it's an N-type semiconductor. Okay, but you can, of course, dope it. Uh, and there are all these various transitions that are happening. That's not so interesting for us at the moment. But remember, it's a closed shell structure and therefore molybdenum sulfide is very chemically inert material. You have these uh, two selenium. Wait, let me show you the structure again. So the orange atoms are your chalcogen atoms and the gray ones are the molybdenum. Okay, so if you look at a monolayer, then it's a closed shell thing. Okay, all the bonding is complete. These are Van der Waals interactions only. And therefore, it's chemically very stable. Uh, in vacuum up to 1203. Does not dissolve in most solvents. Okay. And uh, reacts with oxygen, but at a high temperature. Uh, because this is all your chalcogen atoms. So they have a tendency to get oxidized. But not, not at room temperature. It's very stable. So if I'm looking... If I sum everything up, then I'm looking at these layered materials, 
with this trigonal, trigonal prismatic coordination geometry. And, um, you know, since I can exfoliate, I can change the, the thickness of the materials. And again, I can think of my particle in a box model. I'll say I have tunable band gap, energy band gap. Of course, there's an indirect to direct band gap crossover as I go from um, one monolayer, it's a direct band gap. I go to two, it's an indirect band gap. That is because these interlayer bondings are the ones that uh, tend to come at the bottom of the conduction band, as I mentioned earlier. The excitons are very strongly bound, 240 milli electron volts. Very easy to observe these excitons and the effects associated with that. And because you're worried only about charges being carried across the plane, the mobility is very high. Of course, interplanar mobility is not so high. Hmm? So you're mostly worried about um, one monolayer sheets, you get good mobility. Because of the fact that you have very high sp uh, specific surface area, everything is on the surface, right? You have very high intrinsic catalytic activity. Mm -hmm. And this increases, of course, as you reduce the number of monolayers. You're getting more surface over there. Right. Uh, and all these um, applications, essentially, the electronic applications are also known as the basal plane applications. Okay. So optoelectronics, spintronics, capacitors, batteries, all these. And those that depend on uh, catalysis or are also known as the edge site applications. Well, this is more correct, but basal plane applications is not a very correct terminology because that's not a application of the plane. But yes, this is definitely an edge, uh, the edge site because you have defects on the edges and that's where all the catalysis can take place. So you could use them for electrocatalysis, counter electrodes, photocatalysis, lots and lots of these catalytic activities. All right. Uh, there are many, many various methods of making these uh, transition metal dichalcogenides. For example, simple exfoliation, mechanical exfoliation, chemical exfoliation, physical methods, the CVD, MBE, or uh, the chemical method, solvothermal. And we also introduce the colloidal methods over here because uh, traditionally we've been colloidal chemists. All our um, synthesis of cadmium selenide and 2,6 semiconductors and all the other things, they've uh, been through colloidal routes, okay? And so we are more um, happy and more comfortable with that. And we've introduced some colloidal routes, which I'll show you, okay? So there are uh, lots and lots of various routes. Um, every root has its own pros and cons. I'll not discuss all of that. Okay, and let me again thank uh, the people who've been involved in the research activities that I'm going to show you now. And uh, that's Razi, who started the work on molybdenum sulfide. Sushma, who did a lot of spectroscopy for this work. And mostly what I'm presenting today is the work of Shamim, which is molybdenum selenide and Sushnata, who made a lot of devices, uh, particularly the photoconductive devices. All right. So what you do if you wish to make molybdenum selenide is to take, uh, well, in about four or five years back, take this heptamolybdate, make the acetyl acetonate. Today, you can get this off the shelf. So you can just take molybdenum acetyl acetonate Heat it to a high temperature of 250 degrees. Put some selenium precursor, which is selenium in oil, I mean, and, uh, you know, inject it at high temperature. And you get molybdenum selenide nanosheets. All right. Now, the kind of sheets that, if you've, if anybody has seen these 2D transition metal dichalcogenides, you would see very nice triangle or hexagonal structures. Uh, even people will show you um, atomic resolution 
you know, very nicely arranged atoms over there. So what we get are these crumpled sheets. Huh? Think of a piece of paper that you actually crushed with your hand. That's the kind of image that we see. And the reason for that is because uh, if you look at these uh, orange lines over here, as opposed to the yellow ones, these orange lines indicate vacancies of selenium atoms. And when you have vacancies of selenium, uh, the molybdenum atom from the plane below it tends to attract the next nearest neighbor selenium atoms and therefore that distance gets reduced and it kinds of folds. And you see all these kind of crumples okay, in both these images. Huh? But then we've established that yes, these indeed are because of molybdenum selenide layers and all these high resolution images confirm it corresponds to the D110 plane and D002 plane and so on and so forth, saying that yes, we do have molybdenum selenide. But then crumple sheets do not fetch you much advantage and we had a very difficult time publishing this paper. Huh? But we could, we could do one thing by, uh, you know, Olay Lamine is the one in which we dissolve selenium and by changing the concentration of Olay Lamine, we could change the thickness of the sheets. So if you have lots and lots of Olay Lamine, then it tends to form, you know, get attached over here very strongly. But if you have less Olay Lamine, then you don't have it in this direction. It's only in the lateral direction and allows for growth along the 0, 0, 002 vertical direction. Whereas uh, <clears throat> high concentration restricts your growth. So depending on how much concentration you use, you can um, kind of control the number of monolayers. It's not a very good control, I won't say that but you can to a large extent control. For example, over here, I can show you data from one monolayer nanosheets and six monolayer nanosheets. And if you look at the XRD pattern and focus on the 002 peak, you'd see for one monolayer, there's hardly any intensity. And this is a collection of 20 scan, average of 20 scans in this short uh, narrow region. Uh, for six monolayers, you start to observe some peak. You know, even six monolayers is very low for diffraction, by the way. And of course, you can look at the absorption spectrum with the excitonic features marked as A and B. They're known as A and B excitonic features in uh, the 2D <coughs> transition metal dichalcogenide community. It shifts to the blue. And that is where, you know, you've come down to one monolayer. These these values are very typical of one monolayer for the red curve. Okay. Um, but you know, these materials, uh, they don't have much applications, it seems. But then you have a lot of these defect sites, as you were seeing over here. A lot of these uh, wrinkles that come. And defects are more like your edge sites. Okay. So, Edge sites are always electrochemically, catalytically active. So can we have a much better catalysis if we have more defects? And that was true actually, because Shamim decided to put this material on top of a glassy carbon electrode and then apply a voltage over here, sending in electrons over here and the material catalyzes the reaction, takes the electrons from the water, which is H plus becomes H2 okay. by picking up these electrons. And what you do is you apply the voltage and measure the currents. Higher the current, more the hydrogen that is generated, right? And if you look at these, uh, the pink curve is for platinum, okay? Just no glassy carbon, well, glassy carbon, but we put platinum on top of it. And platinum is the standard for uh, 
<clears throat> getting hydrogen evolution. The hydrogen, the standard hydrogen electrode instead, in fact, uses platinum and things should happen at zero volts, but here happen at 110 millivolts because of some over potentials and, you know, life is not ideal. Uh, for molybdenum, selenide, which is the bulk material, all this activity happens at uh, roughly 500 millivolts. Okay. And 500, so uh, things are reported at minus 10 or 10 milliamperes per centimeter squared, minus being because of the sign convention that is used. Mm -hmm. So when you get a current of 10 milliamperes per centimeter squared of the material, you report that value. Um, it is much lower for, for a single monolayer molybdenum selenide and for six monolayers it's slightly higher and you can see this uh, how fast the current changes essentially tells you how fast the kinetics is and how much hydrogen you can get when you increase your voltage okay you don't have to increase your voltage much but still you can get more hydrogen and that slope okay or the inverse of this slope actually is known as the Tafel slope. It's plotted on a log plot, but the lower the slope, the better the catalytic efficiency. Okay. Of course, all these things are also related to how good a conductor your material is. And you can see these impedance plots uh, where this large, uh, semicircle is for the bulk molybdenum selenide and the small one is for the single monolayer indicating that a single monolayer has much lower resistance and that is true because you have only in-plane conductivity that you have to deal with okay uh, just let me know um, five minutes before I have to stop because I'm not sure sir okay, okay. These, these devices, they are quite stable with time, as you can see over here. But what else can one do? You've replaced platinum, right? And platinum is also there in the dye sensitized soil. Remember, platinum is very, very expensive. Huh? And your molybdenum, self sulfide, selenide, they are dirt cheap. I think the price difference is typically 70 times. So you also have this in disensitized solar cells and uh, the principle is simple that you have a dye that absorbs sunlight. Okay, so the electrons go over here, the holes stay over here. This is your HOMO, that's the LUMO. And then the electrons are collected on titania, which is then given over to the electrode, the fluorine doctin oxide. Uh, this is a per typical configuration. You have the transparent conducting oxide, the FTO. On top of that, you've coated some titania and uh, you've dipped that into the dye solution, which goes and absorbs on titania. And then you have a gap over here, which is filled with the iodide, triiodide, redox electrolyte. Okay. And then you have another counter electrode, which is platinum. Okay. And then you can you can you can put more glass on top of it so if you want light to come in from here also okay so take uh, from the external circuit and measure your potentials currents whatever is coming up now the role of this platinum counter electrode is essentially to catalyze the redox activity of iodide and triiodide and that's how it picks up the holes or gives the electrons to to the homo levels of the dye, okay, whichever way you want to view it. Um, so this redox activity is catalyzed by the platinum counter electrode and to look at that, you normally look at something known as cyclic voltammetry. Okay. You apply a potential and then you see these peaks which correspond to the oxidation peaks and then you apply a reverse potential and see these peaks which correspond to the reduction potential of the iodide triiodide couple and no wonder you can see these with platinum and 
since it's catalyzing, you can also see these two peaks of oxidation, two peaks of reduction with molybdenum selenide almost at the same potential. So molybdenum selenide is also perfectly capable of catalyzing this reaction and we replace. Well, of course, molybdenum selenide has a slightly higher resistance, but we replace this molybdenum uh, platinum with molybdenum selenide and with platinum you're getting typically 8% efficiencies in these N N719 dyes. Uh, these, are, these are, I would say, uh, the best reported efficiencies, you know, between 8 to 9%. Um, with molybdenum selenide you're getting about 7%. You, lost, you lose 1% over here, but then um, you're making much, much cheaper devices. Okay. Well, now that's much you can do with uh, molybdenum selenide as such. Not much. You've exhausted most of the possibilities over there. So, Shamim decides to make some heterostructures. And if you're going to make, make heterostructures, most of the people from the physics community know that you need low lattice mismatches. Uh, most of the people from the chemistry community can outdo the physics stuff. They would say, okay, 4 to 5% lattice mismatch is what best we can handle, but our colloidal methods allow us for even up to 15%. And there are methods over there, something known as the colloidal atomic layer deposition technique, which goes, which allows up to 15%. But those are some very few examples. But 7-8%. 10% is routine using colloidal techniques. So, copper sulfide has about 7% lattice mismatch with molybdenum selenide, and uh, both of them are in the hexagonal phase. So, if you want to calculate the lattice mismatch, all you need to see is this AB uh, 3.29 angstroms, 3.79 angstroms, and you can calculate that. Okay, both are hexagonal. Uh, the band gap of cupric sulfide is 0 EV. And I'll tell you a bit more about this uh, later. Molybdenum selenide, as you've seen, is about 1.1 electron volts. So you couple these two materials. And how to couple them is something very innovative. You have all these defect rich molybdenum selenide nanosheets. Okay. So these are defects, these are uh, vacancies of selenium. So you put some dodecanthiol on top of it and dodecanthiol has sulfur groups, okay, SH groups. Those can fulfill the selenium vacancies. They go and stick on top of uh, these vacancies. And this is something uh, we can also verify by doing some Raman spectroscopy. If you look at this peak, that's the A, A1G, and here you have the E2G, so the out of plane and the in plane modes uh, that are exhibited. And this is for pure molybdenum selenide, and that's for DDT. They don't change much. Of course, there's a change in the frequency, and that is because when you have DDT, some of the bonds get affected. I'll not discuss that. The more important thing is this mode that comes in between. That is because of the presence of defects. You'll never see this mode when you make um, uh, CVD grown molybdenum selenide, sulfide, whatever. Well, uh, sulfide the positions would be different, but selenide. Um, but when you treat this with DDT, the intensity of this defect mode goes down drastically, telling you that your defects have been passivated. Okay. And on top of that, if you're going to throw some cuprous iodide, okay, it's going to form these cuprous sulfide particles on top of molybdenum selenide, and these are attached over here very nicely. You look at some of the TEM images, molybdenum selenide, cuprous sulfide made separately, okay, in the absence of molybdenum selenide. And this is when they are made using the technique I've just discussed above over here and very nicely characterized uh, also with AFM you can see these are all single monolayer molybdenum selenide 
corresponding to about uh, 0 0.7 nanometers height. Uh, again, the XRD, of course, tells you the same thing that I've discussed. Okay, this is a kind of model where uh, you have your defect sites occupied with sulfur. Okay, and lots and lots of these sulfur and then cuprous sulfide grows. So actually we are using a slight excess of DDT so that all these sulfur molecules come in. Copper has a good efficient um, affinity for um, sulfur and it can very easily break the organic chain apart and grow as cuprous sulfide. All right. So some more characters, I can just skip that. But uh, as I was telling you about the model, photo emission data also supports this model that molybdenum is bonded to two different uh, kinds of molybdenum are there. So it's bonded to sulfur and selenium, uh, whereas selenium is bonded only to one species and that's molybdenum. Copper is bonded only to one species and that's sulfur you see on the top. And sulfur is again bonded to two. One is molybdenum and one is copper. And this is what supports and the intensities also, they support the data that this is the kind of model that we should get over here. Okay. Um, very nice inputs from um, our DFT collaborators, Shashwata and Pooja. What they tell us is the kind of heterostructure that you've made. And just focus on the uh, partial density of states over here. The red one is molybdenum selenide does not have any density of states at the top of the valence band, but the bottom of the conduction band is made up of molybdenum selenide, whereas the top of the valence band is essentially cuprous sulfide. Schematically, I would show it like this as a type 2 semiconductor heterojunction where the electrons are pushed over to molybdenum selenide and the holes are taken up by cuprous sulfide. That's a natural charge separation that is happening over there, right? And if that is the case, one tends to make some devices out of it. And because of the natural charge separation, and you see, um, let's, let's look at without thiol, you have, these are photoconductive devices, okay? So, you see hardly any photocurrents. Well, actually, there's a 27-fold increase uh, in the photocurrent when you, when, you, when you do not shine light and when you shine light. With thiol, you've passivated the material. The moment you've passivated the material, you've removed the defect sites, and these defect sites are the traps which trap your electrons or holes, the charge carriers, and do not allow their movement. So you've already gained, okay? So this is 10 to the power minus uh, seven. Okay, one into 10 to the power minus seven, roughly, going to one into 10 to the power minus six. Okay, um, so less than 10 to the power minus seven. So roughly about, uh, this is, I think, about 50 to 60 folds increase. but what you see when you make the heterostructure is you have the effect of passivating the defects, so allowing for the passage of charge carriers and also a natural separation. Okay, and this is typically about 2700, I think, fold increase in the bright to dark current ratios over here. Very, very efficient devices, very, very efficient photo detectors. If you if you have passivated the defects and also the fact that you have natural separation because of the type 2 um, hetero interface. Uh, not just that, if you look at the photo response of these devices, you get photo response in the visible, which is because of molybdenum selenide. Uh, the red one is just molybdenum selenide. The black one is molybdenum selenide cuprous sulfide um, and you see there's a huge uh, photocurrent in the near infrared. Very, very important for both space and defense applications. And over here, if you notice carefully, I've written not cuprous sulfide, but Cu2 minus X 
sulfide. And we do see signatures for Cu 1.96 sulfide and that gives you a lot of copper vacancies or holes in the system and this is because of the surface plasmon that is present in the cuprous sulfide and that's why we see a lot of infrared activity over here. Okay, these are much better devices than the previous ones. You can see there's a six-fold uh, order of magnitude enhancement, well, five-fold at least order of magnitude enhancement between the bright and dark currents over here and these are very stable over time all right what else can one do uh, well you have these counter electrodes for uh, disensitized solar cells you also have counter electrodes for quantum dot sensitized solar cells and those are cuprous sulfide and we shamim decided to use molybdenum selenide cuprous sulfide hoping that uh, you know, it will have much better um, charge carrier efficiency, transport efficiency and, you know, QD solar cells with cadmium selenide do not give you very high efficiency. So, don't worry about 3%, but the fact that it does increase because of the heterostructure is very interesting. What else can one do? Okay, and that is... evident if you look at take a look again at this uh, electronic structure calculations see where the band positions are put the normal hydrogen electrode over here and realize that a little voltage applied to the normal hydrogen electrode takes me to cuprous sulfide and then the cuprous sulfide can give over the electron over here or be positively charged and that is a very good thing if you wish to have oxygen evolution. And on the other hand, I supply a more, slightly more potential over here. And the electron can be given to the conduction band of molybdenum selenide in the material. And if you're giving electrons, then you can bring H plus to H2. And that is very good for hydrogen evolution reaction. And are we able to do that? Yes, we can do that. Oops, we can do that, and for some reason it's moving very slowly. <laughs> All right, we can do that, and if you look at this curve, the pink purple curve, that is for iridium oxide, which is the standard for um, oxygen evolution reaction. If you look at the blue curve, that is molybdenum selenide cuprous sulfide, you know, although it has a slightly higher overt potential, but if you go to about 1.6 volts, you'll see that it gives much higher activity than iridium oxide too. Okay. And again, all these uh, data that I'm showing you over here is essentially telling you all the various reasons. Uh, I've discussed earlier, so I'll not go into that, except for panel D where you can see that the electrochemical surface area is much higher when you have this molybdenum selenide cuprous sulfide as compared to just molybdenum selenide or molybdenum or cuprous sulfide. The electrochemical surface area is not just the area, but the active area, you know, where the catalytic reactions can take place. And the devices are very stable, by the way. Uh, although this data which was published was for 8 hours but now we have for more than 24 hours it's just uh, that, you know, the, the instrument cannot run for so long continuously but otherwise they are very stable and uh, this is the mechanism of the oxygen evolution reaction and this mechanism we again um, are able to deduce with the help of some photo emission data if you look at panel A over here Cupra uh, copper 2p earlier had only one environment but now it has two environments and one is because of copper plus and one is because of copper 2 plus okay one is more oxidized and that allows us uh, to postulate a mechanism over here that we have copper 2 plus we have copper 1 plus the hydroxide 
goes over and attaches to this copper one side. The copper two is already uh, passivated for some reason. But you know, once it goes off, the hydroxide goes off uh, from copper two. That also becomes copper one uh, and can participate in the catalysis activity. So both of these sites are essentially identical. Anything could be copper one, copper two. So now you see both of them have become copper two. And another hydroxide attacks and makes the superoxide and the superoxide releases oxygen and that's how you get oxygen and retrieve your catalytic, uh, catalytically active sites as they were. Okay. The same things uh, you'll see all these reaction pathways. Uh, the pathway shown in green happens to be the least energy pathway. I mean least energetically so most energetically favored pathway uh, compared to molyb just molybdenum selenide or well molybdenum selenide is not good for oxygen evolution anyway cuprous sulfide is the one but it's still lower energy for the heterostructure um, also it's possible to do hydrogen evolution reaction although hydrogen evolution is much better done when you have uh, acidic conditions but oxygen evolution as you saw, the mechanism is under alkaline conditions. So, under alkaline conditions, can we do hydrogen evolution? Yes. This was uh, hydrogen evolution, roughly what 190 millivolts over potential uh, for the heterostructure, molybdenum selenide cuprous sulfide, under acidic conditions. But in alkaline conditions, um, the over potentials are slightly higher, roughly about 400 milli electron volts. But then there's a separate mechanism and not the one. But still, the good thing is that you do have hydrogen evolution under alkaline conditions and therefore you can use this for water splitting from the same pot. Okay. You can have both hydrogen and oxygen coming out from the same material under same conditions. Okay. Uh, now, Doing theory is uh, slightly easier. So Shashwata says, okay, uh, even if I, you know, make molybdenum selenide cesium lead bromide, I get a type 2 heterostructure. Okay, these are his calculations over here. And But just focus on the schematic down here. He says you can get a type 2 structure. If you can make this, um, you'll get uh, very nice... Uh, you know, photoconductive devices and other applications, what you're thinking of. Now, Shashwata doesn't know that cesium lead bromide um, is not very good with water. It's an ionic compound. So it gets destroyed upon contact with water. So I cannot think of catalytic activities. And Shashwata also doesn't know that while you have uh, cuprous sulfide as hexagonal, and it can grow on top of molybdenum selenide. Cesium lead bromide is cubic. Huh? Who on earth could grow a cubic material on top of a hexagonal material? Shamim can. He says, okay, look, I have this defect-rich molybdenum selenide and I know that all the thiols go and bind over there. So let me take a thiol which is 4-aminothiophenol. Okay. So thiol on one end, amine group on the other end, and put it like this, nicely decorated, and throw in some cesium lead bromide. Uh, the ammonium cation goes and attaches to the bromide cation. These are all ionically attached. So all ionic bonds over there. And forms very nice heterostructures. By the way, all these heterostructures are washed at least five times to ensure that no free particles are there. Okay. So, all these heterostructures, you can also see, again, lots of evidence. Let's not worry about it. You can also see that cesium lead bromide has a very high fluorescence quantum efficiency roughly at about 515 nanometers, uh, which drops drastically when you make these heterostructure, the linked material, okay? And also it's evident in the lifetime which gets quenched 
which which becomes much faster as you link the material. Uh, when you do not link the material, you also have a drop in the efficiency, but then that is because of dynamically things are coming close in solution. But the the drop is not so much when you link them and actually brought them in contact. And that is because of the fact that you have a type 2 heterostructure and the electron in the hole gets separated and no longer can recombine to give you good fluorescence efficiencies. So you can of course make your devices with these. Okay. Uh, the same photoconductive devices. Uh, where is it? Move? Okay, don't move. Fine. If you look at uh, the graph over here on the left, okay, ah, now it's come here. Um, the pointer is showing you, it's gone, okay, never mind. The pointer was showing you the place, yeah. This is uh, uh, the brown open dots are molybdenum selenide cuprous sulfide. Yes, the pointer is sitting right on top of it right now. And the one above it, the red one, is molybdenum selenide cesium lead bromide. Okay. Uh, not much difference in the bright currents, but the dark currents in uh, cesium lead bromide are much lower. And this is about ten, five orders of magnitude difference, whereas in um, the cuprous sulfide, we had about three orders of magnitude. But the good thing, three to four orders of magnitude, okay. But the good thing, the another good thing that you see in molybdenum selenide is I have photocurrent even at zero volts. Uh, the reason is because these perovskite materials are photovoltaic materials and uh, we are now making some of these photovoltaic cells with these materials too. Okay. Samir sir. Yes. Uh, I'll just wind up. No, sorry. If you want, you can continue because we are enjoying. <laughs> Thank you so much. But uh, I think I'm almost there. Okay. 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 Fine. Uh, so, you, I've already shown you that low lattice mismatches, we can make heterostructures. High lattice mismatches, we can make these link structures. But can we have another way of making any heterostructure? I don't want any bond, no linker. And I have this student of mine, Ajit. Okay, Ajit is hell-bent on saying, oh man, I want to make something new, something new, and I won't use a bonds, no linkers. And he's made some of these molybdenum selenide tin sulfide nanosheets, which are Van der Waals heterostructures, by the way. Okay, and this is now published very recently. Um, so you can see this. These flat things are the tin sulfide. It's very evident from all the HAADF elemental mapping. You have tin in these flat regions. And molybdenum selenide, of course, is still my crumpled sheet. But tin sulfide, if I make it alone, then it's more like these spherical uh, platelet-like, you know, small um, nanoparticles. Molybdenum selenide is the crumpled thing again. But when you make it in the presence of molybdenum selenide, it starts to grow from some nucleating spots, which we believe are the edge sites. We still don't have evidence for that. But they then make these very nice monolayer sheets. Huh? And these are very lovely things. You can see all the atoms very clearly for tin sulfide. Um, I'll not go into more details. We've used them for, I mean, these are again type 2 heterostructures and we've used them for uh, water splitting applications. I've already shown you some of those. So I'll just summarize that, you know, energy is the most worrisome thing. Uh, whatever you're doing with energy, it's very exciting. Nanomaterials are, of course, very promising for all the energy applications. And 2D materials in particular have an advantage because you can orient them. Okay. Um, they're very good for photo voltaic, photoconductive, for catalytic applications. And the more heterostructures you make, we've I've just listed some heterostructures we've made in our lab. Three fives are some things we've 
We have not yet attempted quaternaries and ternaries. We are doing. Okay. Um, and, you know, we have uh, the possibility of making heterostructures even when we have no lattice matching. You know, you can use linkers, you can use van der Waals. Of course, we have to show this for many, many more materials. Um, one thing what we need to do is to study the excited states to gain more control of the properties. And uh, we are in the process of installing the transient absorption, which I hope should be functional in another month. Okay. But believe me, the road ahead and the most exciting thing are the interfaces. We need to make a lot of heterostructures and um, that is what is going to be very, very exciting and useful. So finally, I'd like to again thank my group uh, whose efforts have led us to such exciting results and the collaborators and the funding agency. And finally, thank you all for your very kind attention. And I'm, uh, I'll be very happy to address any questions that you have. Yes, participants, if you have the any query, then you are free to ask. Okay, no query from the participant side. So, let us thanks to Samir sir. Sir, uh, uh, I think it's a wonderful talk and uh, the students will be highly beneficial and they are able to know how you can use these two-dimensional nanomaterials for the devices application, either Dyson Zai solar cells or either basis of the quantum door Dyson cells. So, uh, once again, I am thankful to you, sir, for sparing your valuable time. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. I'll take your leave then. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Now we have a second speaker, uh, Professor Birpal Ji. Birpal sir, very good morning to uh, Sir, you are not audible. Uh, morning, yes, yes, sir. Now no, you are audible. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So how are you, sir? Uh, I'm fine. Okay, sir, it's a pleasure for us to meet you again. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your invitation and giving me uh, this chance to share my research and all with you people. Thank you, thank you. Very yeah, much. yeah, sir. Uh, always a pleasure to meet you either in online mode or in physical <laughs> physical mode. <laughs> Last time due to due to some restrictions, I I can understand, and you know we could not meet exactly. at your campus. But anyway, <laughs> we will meet again. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. So. Uh, <clears throat> Let us thanks to Birpal sir uh, for this nice opportunity and this uh, it's a pleasure of the Department of Physics and other departments that sir has spared his valuable time and accept our request and uh, uh, ready to deliver a, a talk on a topic of nanomaterials. So let me introduce uh, Birpal sir to all the participants. Birpal sir, uh, Professor Birpal ji. Uh, has uh, done his uh, ma masters in 1997 from CCS University Merit, MPhil in 1998, and PhD in 2002 from CCS University Merit campus. He is holding faculty position in physics department at CCS campus since 2004. Presently, he is working as a professor and head of the department, CCS University Merit. In addition to this, he is also holding the post of the proctor. Security Officer, Deputy Director, Center for International Cooperation in University Administration. He had also worked as a visiting professor in Tokyo University of Science, Tokyo, Japan, and visiting scientist Raman Fellow in University of Richo for a one year. He has supervised more than uh, nearly eight to ten PhDs and. 40 to uh, 45 MPhil students for their research thesis. He has published more than 60 papers in reputable journals and serving as a reviewer of the several national as well as international journals of repute. Recently, he has nominated as an editorial advisory member of the Vigyan Pragati published by the Niskar New Delhi 
and also working as a member of the steering committee for implementation of the NEP 2020 by Higher Education Department, Government of Uttar Pradesh. So, um, once again, thank you very much, sir, for uh, giving your time. So, over to Professor Birpal ji. Thank you, sir. thank you, Professor Praveen Malik, for very uh, elaborate as well and nice introduction. Uh, thank you very much. Now, I am trying to share my uh, PPT with you, people. Hopefully, uh, my slides are visible to you all. Yes, sir. Okay, I am putting slides so it's visible to uh, just uh, just a minute, sir. Uh, yes, please keep in full mode. Uh, I have put the full mode. No, sir. Okay, just a minute. Uh, Professor Praveen, hopefully uh, now the slide show is... No, sir, slide. your slides slides are not visible now. Ah, just a minute, just a minute, I'm checking again. Uh, please try again. Uh, yes, sir. It is visible now. If possible, you can do otherwise. Uh, you can start from here also. It is visible to me. I hope uh, the participant can also see it easily. Uh, okay, okay. So uh, I am trying uh, one once again, and uh, the things are working. Now it's full slide. It's okay. Okay, okay. It's full full slide is visible. Full sir, uh, I can show little bit uh, left side. It's not a full side. Attack, attack. Can see. If it is uh, possible for you, then okay. Otherwise, you can no, continue from here also. My no PC is full, uh, full screen. Sir, do you have the PDF? No, I don't have PDF. I have okay, okay, okay. No, uh, no issue, sir. No issue. Yeah, I, I can, I can see it properly. Oh, no, yes, yes, sir. It was in full slide. Just, just go back. Okay, it's full. Uh, okay, 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 okay. Just a minute, just a minute. Uh, 
Habt ihr das Gefühl, oder? Hm? Okay, hoffentlich, uh, my slides are uh, in full still mode, ne? Uh, this is in... Um, sir, I think uh, you can continue, no issue. That, that is visible properly. Okay, okay, okay. 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 So, uh, uh, yes, sir, uh, can you click on the view? Just a minute. Uh, can you click on view? View option? I, I, I have click on the view. Uh, view. Okay. Slide show and then... <clears throat> view option. Slide show and then... Sir, no issue. You, you can proceed, please. Okay, okay. okay. So thank you very much again and for sorry for disturbance. Uh, anyhow, uh, let me start my talk. The title uh, of my today's talk is Metal Oxide Nanomaterial for Tensing and uh, for some other application. Uh, in this particular talk, uh, I have planned to deliver this talk in three parts. In very first part, uh, in very few slides rather to say, I will say something about my university, about my institution and in second part in uh, three, four slides I will try to define nanoscience, nanotechnology and even nanomaterials and uh, metal oxide nanomaterials and uh, in third part of my presentation I will try to let you know the real work which we are working uh, as far as our research interests are concerned in our laboratory as I will discuss sputtered ground, PD kept uh, copper oxide sensor for hydrogen sensing, I will discuss iron oxide nano particles for sensing a very important drug uh, that is acetaminophen. <coughs> then other applications are concerned, I will discuss white drop zinc oxide for TFT and uh, aluminium drop zinc oxide for photocatalytic degradation of methylene blue and uh, I will discuss CNT, uh, TiO2 nano this fair uh, kind of composites for again photocatalytic degradation of uh, uh, NB and ultimately I will discuss the uh, copper oxide uh, doped and pure copper oxide for different applications uh, for electrochemical performance, uh, electrodes also and uh, at last I, I will again discuss uh, some uh, characterization studies of uh, copper doped zinc oxide thin films as far as uh, its photoluminescence and spectroscopic electrometry is concerned. So that will be all about uh, my presentation. Uh, let me say uh, something about my uh, about my university. Uh, I Professor Praveen Malik introduced me. I am from Chaudhary Charanasing University, Meerut. And this particular university is a big institution of Western Uttar Pradesh. And it is established in 1965 and we have a beautiful campus that is is for our more than 220 acres of land. We have medical college, we have engineering college and uh, at this time uh, we are having more than thousands of colleges that are affiliated with our university and uh, more or less we have all faculties uh, in our <coughs> university, faculty of agriculture, arts, education, science, commerce, engineering, law. So we have a very big system as far as my university is concerned. Uh, this is all about uh, my department, uh, as I told you, um, I am from physics department and uh, our physics department is actively engaged in research in addition to teaching and all and we are working uh, for a research area that concerns on thin films, on nanostructure materials, on atomic collision theory, on condensometer physics, spectroscopic studies and uh, recently uh, one person is working in plasma physics and terahertz and someone is working on atmospheric physics. As far as uh, equipment or major equipment are concerned, we have a uh, clean room facility uh, for uh, nano imprint uh, lithography setup. Uh, we have SEM, we have STM, we have spectrophotometer, ASM, we have a uh, number of uh, techniques for thin film deposition as we have thermal vacuum coating unit, we have RFDC magnetron spectrum system, we have a number of chemical uh, facilities, uh, chemical processing facilities to synthesize nanomaterials. So that was all about the facilities available in our department. This is all about the photographs of that kind of uh, <coughs> facility which we have really uh, in our department. We have spectrum system, SAM, STM, ASM, vacuum coating unit, spectrophotometer, etc. etc. In addition to that, probably we are uh, the first uh, in our state, Uttar Pradesh, that has uh, clean, uh, 10,000 clean room, uh, micro and uh, nano fabrication kind of facilities 
that is equipped by optical stepper with nano imprint lithography attachment for micro and nano fabrication. We have that kind of facility in our department. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, clean room chemical processing facilities that is equipped by laminar flow benches uh, with HIPAA filter, soft plate, and spin portal, etc. Et in addition to that, uh, uh, we are working on uh, sen uh, sensors. So we have smart materials and sensor laboratory in our department. In addition to that, uh, we have a solid state crystal growth laboratory facilities. Uh, uh, one of professor uh, of my department working on some superconducting materials. Uh, he is uh, having uh, that kind of facilities in our department that is equipped by a uh, number of equipments of uh, namely high uh, temperature muffle furnace, crystal growing techniques and quartz tube sealing equipment etc. Et in addition to that, uh, recently uh, we have purchased micro Raman spectrophotometer in DHR ICMR funded project, uh, we have that equipment in our department. And as I told you that one of our professors is working theoretically on simulation kind of activity. And uh, for that we have photonic and metamaterials laboratory. And the beauty of that particular laboratory is that uh, you can access, uh, one can access that particular laboratory uh, remotely and that is available around the clock uh, in our department. That was all about the facilities which really uh, uh, we have in our department and uh, in our university. Uh, this is all about the second part uh, of uh, my lecture. In the second part of my lecture, as I told you, I will discuss something about uh, nanoscience, nanotechnology, nanomaterials, etc. Et so, uh, for that kind of uh, uh, thing, uh, one could start uh, with the definition of material science. Because uh, it's the ultimate science uh, and uh, our all the knowledge which we are learning right now in any discipline or any subject of science, the end use of that kind of knowledge, either we are the student of physics or chemistry or mathematics or uh, any life science uh, department, the end use of that kind of knowledge is really converged to the material. To the material. So material science is very important and it's really a hottest field of R&D. Uh, for physicist, chemist, biologist, engineer, technologist, and many more. So, this particular science, material science or nanostructure materials, are highly interdisciplinary. And as we all know, that uh, material science is nothing, it's simply the structure property relationship in materials. Uh, and uh, again, uh, I may conclude that uh, in materials, always there is a strong relation between structure and property. If you change the structure, your property will change. And just to complete the story of material science, all the way, all the times we are doing the four things. We are processing the materials, we are checking the structure of the materials, we are simply having the properties of the materials, and then we decide that what will be the function of the material for any particular device. And ultimately, for a layman, one can say that we people are interested in the performance of the material. And that performance of any material in any device, starting from your biomaterial to your smart materials, it really comes from the property of that kind of material, which you have used in that particular device. And that particular property which you enjoy for that particular device really depends upon the structure, what kind of structure of, of that material. And here being the student of physics, uh, our concern uh, is with atomic structure, how atoms are arranged. If you change the atomic structure, then obviously property will change. And then that structure is really comes from the processing, how you process the material, how you synthesize the material. So all about in material science, we are doing these four things, the processing, the structure, the property, and the function of materials. And that has linear relationship. Ultimately, the performance of any device depends upon property, and properties comes from structure, and structure uh, really comes from the processing, how you process the material. So we uh, try to do uh, that thing all the way, all the time in material science. And this is all about uh, the material science at a nanometer scale and in 21st century, uh, the material science increasingly focus on uh, nanoscale, uh, 10 to the minus 9 meter and uh, nanostructure materials are very emerging materials nowadays in 21st century. So this is all about uh, the materials and uh, the nanostructure materials. This particular slide uh, really uh, try to realize for beginners who are beginners in nanotechnology or nanoscience that how one can realize uh, the nanometer scale. Uh, sometimes uh, in classroom teaching also we used to write 10 to the minus 9 meter or 1 nanometer. But it is very difficult to realize that particular dimension. 
for the realization of this particular dimension, nanometer dimension, uh, I tried to put a number of examples in this particular slide. At the very first example in the saucer ball, if you compare the size of your saucer ball uh, or your football, that has diameter approximately of 30 centimeter. You consider this and if you reduce the size of this soccer ball or this football having size approximately 30 centimeter by 10 to power 4 times. 10 to power 4 times means uh, 10,000 uh, 10, uh, 10, uh, 10, times. Then you will be reaching at the uh, diameter of your hair. That particular uh, dimension will be of your hair dimension. Then if you reduce the diameter of your hair, uh, by the same amount, by 10 to the power 4 times, then ultimately you will be reaching at the nanometer size. And here I have put carbon nanotube on some electrodes and uh, this is the carbon nanotube and that is really the, having the size approximately 3 nanometer. So this is the one realization uh, of nanometer dimension. Now in another uh, things, you can again uh, uh, realize nanometer dimension as uh, at extremely right uh, I have mentioned. Uh, a 2 meter tall male, male and uh, if you measure the height of this uh, 2 meter approximately 2 meter tall male then the height of this particular human being will be million, billions of nanometer if simply if you measure simply your height in, in nanometer then that will be billions of nanometer and sometimes uh, we bother about that we don't have billions of rupees or billions of dollars so it's my submission to you all that don't bother about dollars and uh, rupees. Uh, being the scientist or being the physicist, enjoy that you have billions of nanometer height uh, being a human being. Okay. So this is all about your height in uh, nanometer. And if you are seeing the, you are seeing this uh, pinhead side patch. So this pinhead side patch, which is uh, is on a thumb, then uh, this particular size uh, pinhead side patch. Uh, is really of millions of nanometer and this is all about the RBCs and the size of RBCs, red blood cells are really the thousands of nanometer and this is all about the DNA, DNA strand and in that case the DNA is a, is a uh, nature made uh, entity and uh, the size of DNA not the length is the width, width of DNA is approximately uh, DNA molecule is approximately 2.5 nanometer so DNA are really the nanometer object and here I have also put the 10 hydrogen atoms, uh, which is a line, line uh, one by one. So if you put approximately 10 hydrogen atoms in a line, then that particular dimension will be approximately one nanometer. And that is the symbol of atom. And we know all well that the atomic size is less than, than, the, than that of your nanometer, 10 times, uh, one, one tenth of the uh, of your uh, nanometer. So this is all about the realization of uh, nanometer scale is starting from atomic size that is greater than uh, that sorry that is less than your uh, nanometer size uh, up to the human being uh, size or the length of human being in in nanometer this is all about the very recent thing as uh, nowadays we are worried about the coronavirus and all so again that kind of viruses uh, that kind of viruses are again uh, in of nanometer range and you will surprise to know that the first coronavirus was uh, uh, seen by uh, a Scottish uh, lady that was the daughter of a bus driver and uh, at the age of 16 she seen that kind of uh, virus uh, that she was uh, June Almedia and uh, she has seen that kind of virus by using uh, an electron microscope at the Ontario Cancer Institute in Toronto in 1963 so uh, viruses are, are again uh, having the dimension of nanometer range. Uh, this is uh, uh, all about uh, uh, the nanoscience and nanotechnology. And uh, in case of nanoscience and nanotechnology, you know all well that uh, the materials properties are different. And the properties of materials are really depends upon size, safe and orientation. Size, safe and orientation dependence properties are really uh, the key point of uh, nanomaterials. And as I told you in the, uh, my first slide that uh, this particular subject, this particular discipline, namely nanoscience and nanotechnology is highly interdisciplinary. Nanoscience and nanotechnology are truly interdisciplinary and uh, we giving together physicists, chemists and biologists. And in that case, the things are interesting that the benefits flow both ways. Uh, the engineers and technologists are looking to biologists to produce better products 
uh, whereas the life scientists uh, are drawing on chemistry and physics to deliver uh, medical benefits and as we all know that uh, medical physics or medical science needs a lot of help from physicists from chemists to uh, deliver the medical benefits so this particular subject is really highly interdisciplinary and ultimately in that case uh, uh, one can say that uh, nanotechnology is not a new idea. People are using that particular kind of technology for thousands of years. And these are some examples that the people have explored uh, the properties of nanoparticles for centuries. This particular uh, uh, painting uh, is the namely uh, labor for, of the month painting and that has been put in Norwich, England and, and, and uh, CA uh, 1480. In this particular painting, there is a ruby color, and people believe, scientists believe that the ruby color is probably due to the embedded gold nanoparticle in this particular painting, and that is of 1480. Uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, there is a wonderful example of Lugras cup uh, that is made of glass and has been put in British Museum in, uh, during 14th century AD. And in that cup, uh, really, uh, it's again a matter of surprising that. Uh, uh, when you illuminate this particular cup from uh, outside of this cup, then it appears green. However, when you illuminate uh, this particular cup by light within the cup, then it glow red. And uh, scientists again believe that uh, the red color is due to very small amount of gold powder, and the amount is very small, that is 40 parts per million uh, in this particular luminous cup. So these are some examples of uh, optical properties, examples of nanomaterials. And uh, due to that, you can see that people are using, uh, having that particular kind of nanoscience and nanotechnology from centuries. And ultimately, uh, uh, sometimes uh, we people think that we are doing great in science and technology. But it's my personal belief that uh, we people are doing, or we, we people are simply copying the things from the nature. So in nature, again, nano, nanoparticles or nanotechnology exist in nature also. The very wonderful example uh, is of spider webs that are made of uh, strong, super strong nanofibers, as well as uh, you have seen the in the lizards and uh, insect and lizards are able to stick to walls because of nanostructures uh, are really uh, on their feet. So these are again the examples of nanoscience and nanotechnology that exist in nature. In addition to that, we uh, always try to see uh, butterflies due to their brilliant color, shiny, uh, receptive uh, colors. So in butterflies, beings, uh, people believe that uh, they contain shiny receptive nanocrystals uh, in the wings of your butterflies. And that, just due to that, uh, we have that attraction towards the butterfly. So uh, one can conclude that uh, nature uh, really has uh, that kind of objects uh, and uh, nature is really the master nanotechnologist one can conclude. Uh, this is all about uh, that uh, materials properties are different in case of nanomaterials. Uh, the very first question uh, should be in our mind that why the changes, why the properties are changes only at uh, nanometer scale for that uh, you may say that uh, at this particular range there is a transition from uh, atoms or molecule to bulk uh, that is only take place at that, that particular range that's why the property changes only at uh, that particular uh, dimension, that particular size, namely at nanometer size. And in that case, as in case of nanomaterials, we all know that the nanomaterials are having large fraction of surface atoms per unit volume, or you can say the surface to volume ratio will be very, very greater than to one. Or when we successively divide the uh, macroscopic object into a smaller object and we reach up to nanometer range, then dramatically, uh, you will uh, see that uh, your uh, surface, uh, all atoms will be on the surface and nothing will be inside. So in that case, your surface to volume ratio will be very, very greater than one. And due to that, uh, your nanomaterial has uh, vast surface area and uh, high uh, surface energy. And uh, that, is, uh, that is one reason uh, to have uh, changes in the properties. And another, another, another reason we know well that uh, that is the quantum confinement effect. So just due to the quantum confinement effect and just due to that surface to volume ratio is very high in case of nanomaterials. So nanomaterials uh, have no melting point. There is a melting point depression in case of nanomaterials. And obviously, uh, if you are having a transition from bulk to nano, then uh, you have reduced uh, lattice constants uh, in case of your material. 
and surprisingly uh, if your bulk material is ferroelectric uh, or that may be ferromagnetic that uh, that may lose their ferroelectricity and ferromagnetism when you have a transition from uh, bulk to nano and uh, again uh, your semiconductor there is a enhancement in the band gap of semiconductors and in some cases uh, with wide band of semiconductors your semiconductors may become insulated that may happen when you have a transition from bulk to nano in case of uh, nano materials and surprisingly you know well all about gold gold uh, you know gold is a really very really wonderful material and it's a biomaterial uh, that may be a biomaterial and that doesn't produce any toxic behavior and that doesn't produce any catalytic activity but your au nano crystals become excellent catalyst at low temperature when you have your gold at uh, nanometer scale and in addition to that your magnetic nanoparticles may go super paramagnetic in nature uh, just due to the quantum confinement and uh, you are seeing here that uh, your super paramagnetic kind of materials that is uh, seen by red line uh, in bh curve that has high saturation magnetization ns is when the value is high and at the same time there is no uh, mr value mr value is zero and just due to that that kind of property your super paramagnetic materials Uh, are really our very useful materials and are using in magnetic recording as usual in addition to that they are using uh, in ferro fluid in imaging uh, in the form of mri uh, they are using in magnetic separation and in addition to that that kind of uh, magnetic material having super paramagnetic uh, nature they are very useful to treat very dangerous disease namely cancer using uh, the concept of hypothermia so that kind of uh, changes really occur when you change when you have a transition from bulk to uh, nano and this is all about how band gap will enhance in case of uh, semiconductor nano materials when we have a transition from bulk to nano and that is just due to the quantum confinement uh, this is all about uh, uh, the nano structures uh, here in this particular slide i try to so you different kind of nano structures uh, and uh, in this particular table i try to mention that in case of nano materials all the way all the times it's the matter of confinement if you uh, confine your material confinement means if you make the dimension of that particular material material in nanometer range then your material feel confined in that particular dimension then the very first parameter or very important parameter of uh, Uh, you can say uh, electronic material that is density of state that vary even a, even a same material if you have uh, bulk if you have quantum well if you have quantum wire if you have quantum rod then the variation of density of state will entirely different than that of your bulk well wire and rod and this is the representation uh, in case of bulk uh, your density of state directly proportional to e to power half is parabolic in nature in case of quantum well where you have one dimensional confinement then in that case your density of state is independent of energy of the same material and uh, if you do the further confinement and you additionally confine one more dimension and ultimately you have two dimensional confinement then in that case your geometry will be quantum wire like geometry and in that case your density of state the variation of density of state will entirely be different than that of your bulk and two dimension that will depends upon e to power minus half 1 by under root e and uh, in case of quantum door where you have ultimate confine confinement you confine your material uh, along x along y and along z in that case your density of state is given by ground delta function when at a at a particular point it has maximum value otherwise it will be zero nearby so this is all about that density of state very differently uh, in case of different nano structures of same materials it means you can moderate you can change all the electronic properties by using that particular science and technology this is all about the different nano structures uh, i have found nano particles over here nano rods nano wires carbon nanotube nano flask and these are not limited that may be more than this that may be nano belt that may be nano ribbon that may be uh nano rice that may be nano needle but uh, simply uh, you can conclude that uh, at least the one dimension should be uh, fall in nanometer range for nano materials and as per their geometry which you are achieving during your synthesis you can give the name of that particular nano material so it's they are not limited uh, as per geometry you can give the name 
And this is all about uh, how you fabricate uh, your nanomaterial, how you synthesize nanomaterial. Obviously, uh, you know all well that there are uh, really two approach. One is top down, uh, and in top down approach, you simply scaling down from bulk, and ultimately uh, you get your nanomaterials. In bottom up, you start from uh, atom or by atom, atom by atom or molecule by molecule, and ultimately you reach at nanometer scale. So these are two approach, and in these two approach, number of techniques are really exist. Uh, to fabricate, to synthesize nanoparticles, and it's again a matter of discussion that what kind of technique, what kind of approach is superior. So philosophically, you may say that uh, bottom up approach is superior than that of your top down approach because uh, in bottom up approach uh, there is a less impurity and it is easier to process. So uh, uh, one can conclude that uh, uh, bottom up approach are superior than that of your top down. and just to strengthen this particular statement one can say that the nature nature again uh, 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 have the nano particles and kind of nano nano science and nanotechnology kind of activities because uh, uh, nature build dna nature uh, build proteins and enzymes and these all are the nano objects so ultimately we can say nanotechnology is already all around us if you know where to look and ultimately nature is the master nanotechnologist and most uh, you can say mostly uh, nature of bottom up approach that's why one can conclude that uh, bottom up approach is superior than that of your top down approach that was all about uh, uh, the nano material the nano science nano technology nano structures and uh, nano fabrications that was the second part of my talk now uh, i'm try to switch uh, on the third part uh, of my talk in which uh, i will try to highlight some research results uh, which we are doing in our department in our research laboratories uh, and as the title of this particular talk is concerned i have to speak on application of metal oxides and uh, in this particular slide you are seeing that metal oxides are really very useful in every you can say field of r&d and uh, you can say in every field of full state devices and you are seeing that uh, there is a, a use of metal oxide kind of materials in energy production uh in energy production uh, in the form of solar cells in the form of fuel cells in the form of thermoelectric generators and uh, at the same time metal oxides are very useful in energy storage as you know all well that they are very useful in batteries in super capacitors etc etc in addition to that uh, metal oxides are very useful even in energy conversion for hydrogen economy for water splitting for by uh, diesel production etc etc and in addition to that uh, your uh, metal oxide nano particles or metal oxide nano materials or even metal oxides one can say very useful uh, in gas sensors for uh, your hydrogen gas sensor for your carbon uh, carbon monoxide gas sensor uh, and many more uh, hydrogen sulfide gas sensors etc so that kind of materials are very useful uh, now in our research uh, one of my student uh, really uh, synthesized uh, really uh, deposited uh, pv capped copper oxide thin films and uh, he used that pv capped copper oxide thin films for sensing hydrogen and you know that uh, hydrogen uh, may be the future fuel for uh, across the globe because hydrogen really has great potential as a key clean and promising energy source so the accurate and you can say the reliable sensitive and selective measurement of uh, uh, hydrogen is very uh, very much required and uh, uh, we success successfully uh, sense uh, hydrogen by using pd capped copper oxide thin films uh, in our laboratory uh, by using uh, that kind of uh, set up for sensing measurements uh, in that case in this particular kind of gas sensors uh, we have used copper oxide thin films and uh, that was pd cap pd used as catalyst over here just to uh, increase or just to enhance the sensitivity of the device and uh, we uh, we use uh, the concept that uh, electrical resistance in presence of hydrogen gas will change and ultimately uh, we measure that kind of measurement using iv measurements and using that kind of kit setup uh, using two probes method uh, in our laboratory uh, this is all about uh, the characterization results of uh, pd capped copper oxide thin films 
we characterize as usual uh, samples or films by uh, XRV and we try to calculate particle size, lattice parameters and uh, then claim that uh, ultimately we have copper oxide uh, thin films which we deposited by using sputtering technique and in that case there are number of parameters, there are time, there are ratio of your uh, reactive gas because in that case we use copper as a target and uh, we do the reactive sputtering uh, for uh, making copper oxide thin films and uh, ultimately uh, we uh, confirm the composition and all by using XPS uh, and ultimately uh, just to know the surface morphology we go for is scanning electron microscope and just by its cross-sectional view we try to uh, see the thickness of the deposited film uh, in our case and again just to know the particle size distribution and the surface morphology we go for atomic force microscope uh, of uh, egg deposited uh, PD cap copper oxide thin films. Uh, this is all about uh, uh, the results, the sensing results of uh, uh, hydrogen sensing using PD cap copper oxide thin films. Now this paper has been published in a journal, it's not under review, uh, I have mentioned that just before uh, at that time when it was under communication and review. So uh, this is all about the uh, sensing results uh, of our case and you just see this one, this is the IV characteristics uh, of your, of PV uh, kept copper oxide symptoms. Then in that case, uh, this red one uh, is, the, is for air. And uh, when we expose uh, our film by hydrogen gas, then you are seeing the IV characteristic changes and the current is changing in that case. And ultimately, resistance will change, resistivity will change. And just by uh, that logic, that uh, you can say idea, one can sense that particular gas accurately or you can say selectively uh, by using PD cap copper oxide thin films, which we uh, did in our laboratory. Uh, this is all about the highlights points uh, which we uh, achieved in that case we successfully uh, deposited copper oxide uh, thin films by sputtering and then we kept that by pd cap, uh, pd uh, material that is just uh, that will just uh, act as cattling agent in that case and in that case uh, again we sense hydrogen uh, and the amount uh, of the concentration ranging from 100 to 1000 uh, ppm uh, level and uh, in that case we achieve the fast response of 10 seconds and the recovery time of, of, of 50 seconds uh, and that was uh, temperature of uh, 300 degree centigrade. So we have that kind of results and successfully we sense uh, hydrogen which may be the future fuel uh, across the globe by using uh, uh, PD cap copper oxide thin films and uh, we published this particular uh, uh, research results in Journal of Electronic Materials uh, recently. Uh, this is all about uh, the second material uh, which we have uh, used uh, in, in our research, uh, iron oxide. Iron oxide is again very important material and the beauty of iron oxide is that, that it's a biocompatible. And again, uh, this particular material has very wide applications uh, in case of magnetic and uh, your memory storage devices or applications. But in addition to that, in addition to magnetic and memory storage devices, uh, iron oxide is very useful material uh, for other applications and for sensors as we did in our research for photocatalytic, for water splitting and even for water treatment. And this is all about the different phase of iron oxide that iron oxide may be in your uh, FeO form, maybe Fe3O4, it's a uh, mixed valent compound uh, in which uh, your iron will be in uh, divalent and trivalent state. And then uh, your Fe2O3 will may be in alpha phase, beta, gamma, and even in SRM phase. So uh, when you synthesize iron oxide nanomaterial, it's really a challenge to control the phase. So in our research, we try to control the uh, phase, required phase of iron oxide nanoparticles. And uh, in our research, we synthesize Fe3O4 uh, iron oxide nanoparticle and uh, uh, alpha phase of uh, uh, Fe2O3 nanoparticle and uh, we synthesize Fe3O4 and alpha Fe2O3 uh, by using co precipitation method and by a single method in that case uh, at higher temperature at about 700 degree centigrade Fe3O4 uh, when it was annealed at about 700 degree centigrade in open atmosphere then that transform to alpha phase of iron oxide that is a hematite alpha Fe2O3 phase. 
desynthesize it and uh, we use SC3O4 as well as alpha SC2O3 for sensing a very important drug that is acetaminophen. Acetaminophen is really very important drug and we people, we all uh, 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 used to have that kind of drug uh, namely uh, acetaminophen is a chemical name but in general uh, we used to uh, have the name of that particular drug as Dolo, Calpol or Tylenol. I will show you and uh, in second exercise uh, we synthesize uh, or we control the phase of iron oxide and we uh, synthesize in a single, uh, you can say, slot, uh, gamma phase of iron oxide nanoparticle, although the synthesis was in two process, but ultimately we get the gamma phase of Fe2O3 nanoparticle in our case, and then we use that particular uh, kind of nanoparticle, gamma phase of iron oxide for sensing acetaminophen. Uh, this is all about the characterization techniques, uh, as usually uh, we have XRD, uh, we have uh, a particle uh, size determination by using scalar formula, by using double H plot, these are not the new thing for researchers. Every researcher try to have that kind of uh, exercise just to calculate the phase, just to calculate the particle size and we also did the same thing just to calculate the particle size and just to uh, realize that what kind of phase we have in the case of iron oxide nanoparticles. So we go for that. Uh, this is all about uh, 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 that how uh, Fe3O4 uh, changes to alpha phase of Fe2O3. For that, we go for TGA, we go for DSC analysis, and ultimately, uh, in TGA, uh, we found uh, three weight loss. Uh, one weight loss was uh, in between 330 uh, to 200 degrees centigrade, that was approximately 3%, and that was just due to the emission of uh, physically absorbed water in the sample. Whereas the second major loss that was approximately of 3.2% and that was in between 200 to 300 degree centigrade and that is really the oxidation of Fe2 iron oxide and ultimately uh, the second weight loss that was much smaller than that of your first and uh, second one that was 1.6% and that was occur in between 300 to 700 degree centigrade and beyond 700 degree centigrade uh, uh, because we centered it up, uh, up to uh, 800 degrees centigrade that was almost constant. So in that case uh, that really suggests that there is a complete phase transition uh, uh, to alpha phase of iron oxide nanoparticles. And as I told you that uh, Fe3O4 and your alpha phase uh, uh, of Fe2O3, uh, it's very difficult to uh, control the phase and identify the phase. So for, the, uh, so for uh, confirmation, uh, we did Raman uh, spectroscopy of uh, these samples also and ultimately we confirmed that we have desired phase of our iron oxide nanoparticles. Uh, this is all about the application of uh, 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 that kind of iron oxide nanoparticles for uh, electrochemical uh, sensing of a very important drug acetaminophen. And acetaminophen you all know well that uh, in US uh, that particular drug uh, is known as uh, Tylenol. And in our country, we typically used to uh, name this particular drug as paracetamol, as dolo, as calpol, etc, etc. And you know well that uh, this is a very important analgesic and antipyretic drug. And we all used to have this particular drug whenever we feel some headache, we feel some fever uh, in our body. So, you know, the control dose of uh, that particular drug doesn't produce any harmful side effects. That's why we people really uh, uh, have that particular drug without any prescription uh, um, uh, of the doctors. Um, but you know, the overdose of that particular drug really creates a uh, very severe effect. So you know, the biocompatible, very fast, accurate and uh, easy uh, or sensitive reduction of this particular drug, namely Dolo or Paracetamol uh, or chemical name is acetaminophen is quite important. And uh, uh, the idea uh, uh, of sensing this particular drug by using uh, iron oxide nanoparticles is really of that, that uh, acetaminophen is a cyclic aromatic amide and uh, that really uh, shows a redox process and that is oxidized in uh, NAPQI in an aqua solution. So that was the idea that uh, one can sense this particular drug electrochemically uh, by using iron oxide or other materials. So we sense this particular drug uh, for 
the sensing of this uh, uh, acetaminophen and in general people are using uh, different methods as uh, scientists are using high performance liquid uh, chromatography hplc some are using spectrophotometry some are using liquid chromatography some are using electro spray mass spectrometry and some are using spectrophotometry and the all techniques which i mention over here in this particular slide are really highly uh, cost having highly cost and are really complicated uh, in operation but the proposed technique which we are really uh, uh, we, we have really did in our research uh, we sent this particular drug electrochemically uh, and this particular technique uh, is really uh, you can say very simple and rapid and economical and again uh, as far as the pharmaceutical industry is concerned because iron oxide is biocompatible so one can claim that uh, it's again really a biocompatible technique just to sense this particular drug uh, acetaminophen so that was the idea and in this particular slide i have shown that uh, we have used gamma phase of iron oxide nanoparticle uh, to sense uh, this particular drug acetaminophen or calpol or dolo and again the uh, thing is that that uh, in uh, our uh, three cell electrode we modified a uh, glassy carbon electrode which was the working electrode by our iron oxide nanoparticles and then uh, we go for cv measurement of uh, this particular exercise or experiment and in that case you are seeing that uh, uh, without acetaminophen this is all about the cv measurement of bare glassy carbon electrode as well as modified glassy carbon electrode uh, whenever you have uh, acetaminophen or you have your drug in the solution then uh, uh, i have taken that uh, concentration 10 to the minus 3 mole acetaminophen that in that case the red one shows the bare glassy carbon electrode behavior of cv measurement as well as the black one shows the modified glassy carbon electrode behavior of cv measurements and in that case you are easily seeing that there is a uh, huge increment in the anodic peak current and that increment in the anodic peak current in the cv measurements really give an idea that one can sense this particular drug electrochemically uh, or elect uh, by using uh, el electrochemical method uh, by using iron oxide nanoparticles and that may be just due to the high surface area of uh, iron oxide nanoparticles which we have synthesized synthesized uh, in our research so that was the idea this is all about uh, the cv measurements of uh, uh, our uh, iron oxide nanoparticle modified glassy carbon electrode at a different concentration of acetaminophen and you are seeing over here that uh, we start our experiment from 10 to the power minus 3 mole acetaminophen concentration and we go up to 10 to the power minus 5 mole acetaminophen concentration which is very close to micromole and uh, we found that uh, there is a linear relationship in between the uh, anodic peak current and the uh, acetaminophen concentration and by that idea we claim that uh, we can easily sense up to very small amount of uh, acetaminophen by using this particular material as uh, time is uh, short so i will move fast uh, in the in this particular slide i try to show that uh, what are the procedure and uh, what about the stability so we found that the procedure was uh, diffusion and uh, our technique or our method is very stable and uh, uh, we go for 20 cycle and there is no change in the cv measurement so we can say the method is quite stable and this is all about the linearity the concentration range the reduction limit and the sensitivity of uh, electrochemical sensing of acetaminophen using uh, gamma phase of iron oxide nanoparticles as a modified electrode as to modify the electrode so that was all about uh, the, the sensing of drug and uh, uh, we again try to sense uh, uh, the another, another drug and that was the hydrogen peroxide uh, in our case again hydrogen peroxide is again a very important chemical or the material and we try to sense this particular drug by using the same concept and uh, we have more or less uh, uh, you can say the same concept is over here same uh, anodic peak with current variation is over here and we sense this particular drug by using uh, uh, gamma phase of iron oxide nanoparticles and as a result we publish that kind of uh, research results in so many journals as i have shown you and material research express and in indian journal of pure applied physics so that was all about the sensing now in uh, the uh, the last part of our my lecture 
I will try to show you the different applications of metal oxide nanomaterials. Uh, and the, uh, another application, uh, we use metal oxide uh, nanomaterials or nanoparticles in the form of uh, thin film uh, for uh, making thin film transistors. Because thin film transistors are really, really again a very important device for solid state devices. And in that case, uh, there are a number of advantages of uh, that kind of TFT that are portable, there is a low power consumption, lightweight and various commercial applications are really having of uh, the TFTs. And uh, ultimately, the research is going on just to uh, enhance the parameter, TFT parameter, as the mobility, as the on-off ratio and the threshold voltage. This is all about the different structures and the mechanism of TFT. Uh, someone may be interested uh, to have that kind of mechanism and all. This is all about the different state of art applications of TFT. In flexible LCDs, in mobile phones, in LCD displays, in image sensing, even in uh, smart cars, uh, even in RFID tags, even in uh, your temperature sensors, even in very, very latestly, even in smart textile. Even uh, in our clothing, even in our textile, we can use the TFT for so many applications. It is a, a very recent, uh, 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 you can say, application of TFTs uh, in textile industry. Uh, this is all about the wide Doppler uh, zinc oxide uh, we, we synthesize. We fabricate uh, uh, wide Doppler zinc oxide thin films, and then we use that wide Doppler zinc oxide thin films uh, as a TFT. Uh, this is all about the structure and this is all about the XRD uh, for that particular thin films. And ultimately, uh, we have transfer characteristics uh, of undocked zinc oxide and wide dog zinc oxide uh, uh, TFTs. And ultimately, we found that wide dog zinc oxide uh, TFTs solved remarkable result in comparison to pristine zinc oxide thin films. And this is all about the same and all of the materials. And ultimately, uh, we publish that kind of results uh, in material science and semiconductor processing published by elsewhere. And in addition to that, although it's not the metal oxide, one of my students working on MOS2, which is a 2D material, and uh, we use uh, uh, MOS2 uh, thin films, which we deposited by using a sputtering, uh, and we try to fabricate TFT for that, and successfully uh, we fabricate uh, TFT by using MOS2. Uh, vertically aligned MOS2 layers and we published that result recently in materials letters. Uh, this is all about uh, uh, the different applications of metal oxides as I told you in Petrocatalyst and I will skip that very quickly. This is all about uh, the mechanism that uh, how one can uh, use aluminium drop zinc oxide for photocatalytic activities for degradation of metal in blue. This is all about the results of uh, that kind of uh, research and we published that in solid state sciences. This is all about uh, the CNT TiO2 nanocomposite and uh, again we use that for photocatalytic application for degradation of methylene blue. Uh, we synthesize that by chemical method, by hydrothermal method and ultimately uh, we characterize that by XRD, by PEN, uh, and ultimately, in that case, so we found very wonderful structure. We found nano flower kind of structures, and we use that nano flower kind of structure for uh, photocatalytic application of methylene blue degradation. Uh, this is all about uh, the same image of TiO2 nano flower. It is as same as you are seeing this particular flower. Uh, we uh, grow that kind of structure, TiO2 nano flower structures uh, in our research. One of my staff working on that, and we successfully completed. Uh, uh, his PhD uh, on this particular material. This is all about the results of photodegradation and the mechanism of photodegradation, uh, mechanism of uh, CMTT to the composites. And we publish again that in solid state sciences, uh, published by Alphier. Uh, this is all about the different application of uh, zinc oxide. One of my students uh, deposited aluminum doctor uh, zinc oxide thin films by using a very simple spray analysis technique. And uh, again, uh, he got very wonderful structures uh, uh, somehow and uh, that kind of, uh, you, you say, uh, cashew nut kind of structures uh, seen by scanning electron microscope. And uh, he go for uh, the thermoelectric, uh, uh, you can see measurement for that particular kind of material, uh, aluminum doctor zinc oxide thin film. He calculates feedback coefficient and all, and he claimed that that particular material 
एल्यूमिनियम डॉक जिंक ऑक्साइड सिल्क में भी वेरी यूज फॉर फॉर थर्मोलेक्ट्रिक एप्लीकेशन दिस इज ऑल अबाउट कॉपर ऑक्साइड वन ऑफ माई स्टूडेंट स्टडी कॉपर ऑक्साइड वेल सी सिंथेसाइज कॉपर ऑक्साइड नैनो पार्टिकल सी डी ड्रॉपिंग ऑफ सीओ एंड एन एन एंड देन सी अल्टीमेटली चेंज द मैग्नेटिक बिहेवियर ऑफ कॉपर ऑक्साइड by doping and these are all the results of xps and all raman and pl of that kind of material and ultimately she published that uh, in solid state sciences published by lc again and uh, this is all about uh, that uh, she again uh, did a uh, uh, co and uh, iron doped copper oxide nano structures uh, fabricated uh, uh, using again the uh, hydrothermal method and uh, she uh, used that particular kind of material as a Uh, electrode material uh, in uh, super for super capacitor application and found very remarkable electrochemical performance of the material. Uh, one of my students recently uh, uh, deposited, uh, uh, you can say, copper doped zinc oxide film films uh, by using sputtering and uh, studies uh, photoluminescence and spectroscopic uh, electrometry of uh, this particular material. And get published the results uh, in a very good journal, namely Optic. Uh, this is all about uh, the because our group uh, really working on uh, uh, focusing working on uh, metal oxide uh, nanoparticles. So our group recently published a very wonderful uh, review uh, in RSE nanostructure metal oxide semiconductor based sensors for greenhouse gas detections, their progress and challenges. And this particular review is uh, open access, free uh, free to access. And it's really a complete capsule of metal oxide uh, nanoparticles, uh, as far as their applications uh, are concerned uh, in sensing, uh, especially for greenhouse gas detections. One can uh, go also with that kind of review if someone is interested uh, to have that kind of research in uh, his or her future uh, on metal oxide nanoparticles. This is all about the another work that uh, as I told you that one of my friend working on MOS2. Uh, she successfully fabricated TFT uh, using MOS2 uh, thin films, uh, uh, synthesized by uh, deposited by sputtering technique. She again uh, uh, have uh, MOS2 nanowarm thin films, and that was CU functionalized with CU doping, and uh, she sense nitrogen dioxide gas. By using uh, that uh, CU functionalized MOS2 nanowarm, although that's not the metal oxide, but uh, just to just for sake of uh, showing the results, uh, I put that particular slide in this particular presentation. And this is all about again a very wonderful review which we uh, completed and published in a RSE Sensors and Diagnostics recently. And that particular review is somehow interdisciplinary. In this particular review, uh, our research group. Uh, 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 review the metal oxide nanomaterials based sensors for monitoring environmental NO2 and its impact on plant ecosystem. Uh, really a life science kind of activity, and uh, we publish it and it's again an open access uh, kind of article. Uh, you can go through with that. This is all about the findings which uh, I have discussed uh, uh, with different materials with the PD cap copper oxide uh, thin film which we deposited by sputtering and used for uh, hydrogen sensing. Uh, secondly, we successfully uh, uh, synthesize iron oxide nanoparticles and control its phase uh, in terms of magnetite, hematite, and magnemite. And ultimately, we use that kind of uh, biocompatible material for sensing a very important drug, uh, acetaminophen, as well as hydrogen peroxide. So that particular kind of material or that particular kind of research may be very useful for pharmaceutical industry in future. And uh, we successfully synthesis uh, synthesize wide of zinc oxide thin films and we use that kind of thin film for TFT. In addition to that, uh, we synthesize MOS2 thin films and again go for TFT and C from flies MOS2 uh, for uh, sensing of nitrogen dioxide. And uh, this is uh, all about zinc oxide and we use zinc oxide for photocatalytic applications and the copper oxide for. Uh, changing the behavior, magnetic behavior of the material by doping, and ultimately 
uh, the, our cobalt and the iron doped nanostructure we use for that kind of nanomaterials for electrochemical performance in supercapacitor. And uh, one of my friends, uh, as I told you, uh, really interested in different kind of, uh, uh, you can say, application of uh, iron, uh, iron oxide, uh, zinc, sorry, zinc oxide, aluminum zinc, uh, doped zinc oxide, and uh, he calculates C B coefficient and all. And maybe uh, this particular material may be very useful for thermal uh, uh, application of the material. And uh, ultimately, recently, one of my friends synthesized uh, copper doped zinc oxide thin films, and uh, he characterized that for photoluminescent applications and for spectroscopic electrometry successfully. And uh, uh, again, uh, uh, some of our friends are working on. Um, Carbonous based uh, copper oxide thin film for super capacitors and for sensing applications. So, that was all about the conclusions and findings of our research group. Uh, it's not of my, uh, all of my research. Uh, uh, this is all about of my uh, students' work, which I try to present over here. Uh, so, thanks to you all. And this is a very small group of research. Uh, uh, few students are working with me, and few teachers are collaborating with me in my department. So with these words, let me say thanks to you for patience uh, listening uh, of my presentation and I welcome if you have any query, any questions uh, related to my work and all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, for this highly informative talk. Uh, Thank you uh, for presenting and sharing your wonderful work on metal oxide nanomaterials, basically. Uh, now, again, I open up the session for participants' query. Uh, if no query, then once again, on the behalf of organizing team, uh, I thank Professor B. Pal Singh, sir, for accepting our request and sparing his valuable time. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor uh, Praveen, and I don't know the name, uh, uh, Madam. Uh, thank you, you also. And, uh, thanks for your uh, invitation as well as giving me the opportunity to present my research work, my student research work in front of learned uh, participants. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, I may uh, leave uh, at this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, are you there? There is a question in chat box. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I, uh, there is a question in chat box that what is the nature of metal oxide nanoparticles? Ah, nature uh, means uh, uh, nature of semiconducting uh, kind of nature. In terms of conductivity, uh, first, for, uh, first it should be uh, nature in what context? If he or she is asking that uh, either they are magnetic or they are semiconducting, mostly the metal oxides uh, materials are semiconducting. They are semiconducting in nature, mostly. And okay. the oxide that is magnetic in nature, but mostly uh, the uh, nature of that kind of materials are semiconducting in nature. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Once again, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I thank all the participants also for their patience and presence. Uh, now we end the session and we will meet to, uh, tomorrow as per the schedule of the STC. Thank you so sir, much. Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, I found doubt with respect to zinc oxide. Sir? Yeah. Sir, the zinc oxide nanoparticles is basically a, a, a semiconductor uh, N type, no? Yeah, yeah, obviously. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, either uh, we can uh, develop a P type of yeah. semiconductor. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, in general, zinc oxide is anti semiconductor. But anyhow, you can by doing some doping. In our research also, if you search even my research paper, in some of research work, we try to fabricate, we try to realize, even better to say realize, 
T-type conductivity even in zinc oxide. But it's really, really, very really, uh, difficult task and really, very really wonderful work just to realize T-type conductivity in zinc oxide. But you can, you can by having some kind of doping in the material uh, zinc oxide, uh, you can realize P-type conductivity even in zinc oxide. And uh, in the, uh, for uh, references, you may go for uh, my own research. Uh, in uh, some of my research work, one of my students, uh, Mr. Dr. Manoj Kumar, really uh, realized P type conductivity uh, in zinc oxide. It may be. Okay, sir. Thank you very much, sir. But there is an issue of stability and there is an issue of uh, number of things are over there, but you can realize yes, P type conductivity in zinc oxide. <laughs> okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for your. And okay, thank you, sir. I think now thank we you. can end the session. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If. Thank you. We say good luck and grand success of your event. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, sir. Okay, particip participants. Now we end the session.